Let's now discuss the management of intracapsular fractures. A useful memory aid to help you remember the basic principles of managing intracapsular fractures is 1-2, give it a screw, 3-4, Austin Moore. 1-2 refers to type 1 and type 2 garden fractures, and give it a screw refers to the fact that type 1 and type 2 garden fractures are generally surgically fixed with screws. 3-4 refers to type 3 and type 4 garden fractures. Austin Moore refers to a type of arthroplasty. Arthroplasty means some form of joint replacement. So basically, type 3 and type 4 garden fractures are usually managed with some form of joint replacement. Let's go into detail of the different management pathways. Let's consider the management of displaced and undisplaced fractures separately, because they are managed very differently. Let's consider the management of a undisplaced fracture in a young patient. So if the patient is in very little pain, then the patient could potentially be managed conservatively with no need for surgery. But often patients will need surgical fixation using screws. Examples of screws used are cannulated screws. Surgical fixation with screws is usually the best option here as it prevents further displacement of the fracture and allows patients to keep their native femoral head. Preserving the patient's native hip is very important, particularly in young patients presenting with intracapsular fractures as they're expected to live longer and be more active. A joint replacement will not usually be used here because joint replacements don't last forever and patients will likely need further surgery. Now for an elderly patient, it's important to first make an assessment of the patient's medical and mobility status. If the patient is well, fit, independent, or has no significant comorbidities, then a surgical fixation with screws is usually performed. And it's performed for the same reasons that it's performed in young patients, as it improves the long-term functional outcomes. If the patient is very unwell, is in a lot of pain, or has dementia, which could increase the risk of falls, then a surgeon might consider doing a hemiarthroplasty, which is a half hip replacement where only the femoral head is replaced. So remember, undisplaced fractures include type 1 and type 2 garden fractures. Let's discuss displaced fracture management, which includes type 3 and type 4 garden fractures. Remember, displaced fractures have a high risk of developing avascular necrosis. So this is why patients with displaced fractures will usually need some form of hip replacement. Let's start with the management of displaced fractures in an elderly patient. Again, it's important to make an assessment of the patient's medical and mobility status. Let's consider a patient who is fit and independent. The current NICE guidelines defines these patients as patients who are able to walk independently out of doors with no more than one stick to mobilize and are not cognitively impaired. The NICE guideline states that these patients should have a total hip replacement as opposed to a hemiarthroplasty. A total hip replacement is preferred to a hemiarthroplasty here because a total hip replacement can help get an implant which is more similar to the patient's original anatomy and this can help the joint get a better return to function and ultimately it can help the patient reach their original mobility levels which they had before they got the fracture in the first place. A hemiarthroplasty would not be performed usually in this situation because a hemiarthroplasty implant only replaces part of the joint, so the joint will have a different anatomy and the patient will likely not return to their normal full function. Surgical fixation is not usually considered in this age group because even though surgical fixation could help correct the displacement, there is still a significantly high risk of avascular necrosis and the risks of having further surgery to help correct the avascular necrosis is too high in this age group. Now for patients who don't fit that NICE criteria, for example, they are dependent on support or have significant comorbidities, then usually a hemiarthroplasty is performed. A hemiarthroplasty is performed here because the patients already have limited mobility. Let's now discuss the management of displaced fractures in younger patients. Now remember I told you that preserving the patient's native femoral hip is a really important aspect of managing hip fractures in younger patients because it can help give better long-term functional outcomes. This is why surgical fixation is done, as it will preserve the native femoral head of the patient. The screws in this situation may be dynamic hip screws. The reason surgical fixation is done in younger patients compared to elderly patients is that patients will still have a high risk of developing avascular necrosis even after surgical fixation. So we'll likely need further surgery to help correct the avascular necrosis. But because these patients are younger, they are more likely to be fit enough to survive another operation compared to elderly patients where there is a much higher risk. This is why surgical fixation is preferred in younger patients compared to elderly patients. If the surgical fixation fails or if the femoral head does not survive, then a total hip replacement should be performed for this patient.
So that is a summary of the management of intercapsular fractures. Finally, let's discuss extracapsular fractures. Now remember, extracapsular fractures had a lower risk of avascular necrosis compared to intracapsular fractures. There is no formal named classification system for the severity of extracapsular fractures, like the Gardens classification for the intracapsular fractures, but it can be classified according to the number of parts of the fracture, and this can help classify the severity of extracapsular fractures. Now let's discuss the management of extracapsular fractures. Intertrochanteric fractures are a type of extracapsular fractures we discussed earlier, and they are usually managed by surgical fixation, and the screws used are usually dynamic screws. Now for subtrochanteric fractures, they are usually managed again through surgical fixation, but this time with intramedullary nails. Intramedullary nails have been shown to have better results than dynamic screws for subtrochanteric fractures. And that is a summary of the management of extracapsular fractures.